Okay. And welcome again to everyone for our Humanities Tennessee sponsored Tennessee Constitution um, Teachers Webinar for summer 2022. Humanities Tennessee is an incredible resource for humanities study, humanities teachers, humanities students from around the state. I encourage you to check them out. I will put their information in the chat box just shortly. And they also have teacher grant programs, but we, we work with them every summer. They sponsor teacher professional development opportunities. In fact, last week we were on a teacher institute studying the Trail of Tears. It was actually, um, we went to sites related to the Trail of Tears in Northeast Georgia and in Southeast Tennessee. So Humanities Tennessee does some great things and for the East Tennessee Historical Society, um, they do great things for teachers as well as sponsor our exhibits and other efforts. Um, they also co-sponsor um, registration fees so that they assist with registration for students in National History Day competition at state level. If they advance to state, they offset some of those costs. So Humanities Tennessee does a great job um, across the state and we thank them very much. But I want to, um, without any ado, I want to go ahead and introduce one of our incredible partners in downtown Knoxville. Um, if you've not had the opportunity to visit the historic house museums in Knoxville, there are a number from different time periods. Um, if you're in the region, they're great resources for your students. Um, if you don't have, can't bring your students, then I encourage you to visit all of our historic house museums in Knoxville and come yourself, bring your camera, bring, you know, make videos, make pictures or whatever to be able to prepare something for back when you get in the classroom with the um, curator's permission, of course, and with the directors knowing why you're making photographs. Um, but they would love to work with you um, because everyone's very excited about sharing their resources across the state and making themselves available and accessible to you as a teacher and to your students. But Dave Hearns and I have worked um, a good bit together um, over gosh, over the last probably five or six years, if not more, in partnering with student tours. Um, they might come to us for part of the day and go to Dave or either that we split the groups and share because we're only about four blocks apart. And um, he is the director of the Blunt Mansion Association. And I'm going to um, let Dave take it from there. And Dave, I think that I have made you a co-host. So if you want to... Um, log on. Yep, there he is. And I think that everything should be working from there. So if you want to take it from there, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about William Blunt and about this constitution and we'll let you go from there. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to start off by apologizing for not being in Blunt's office. We had some technical difficulties this morning. Uh, kept me from being able to get a good enough signal to I wouldn't sound like a robot and look all crazy. So figured better to be able to hear me. Um, uh, Lisa and I have been working together a good long while. It's more like nine years, uh, actually, uh, but time flies when you're having fun. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today, what I'm going to talk about today is going to be um, as Lisa said, we're going to talk about William Blunt. We're going to talk about his role in helping to create the state of Tennessee, talk some about the Tennessee, uh, the first Tennessee Constitution, 1796, and what um, my museum can do for you all. Um, so let me see, I should be able to let's see if I can share this. Uh, Sorry, hang on one second. I'm a little new at the Zoom thing. I'm trying to do a PowerPoint. Share screen. PowerPoint. There we are. Okay. Let's see what this do. All right. Hopefully everybody can see it. Lisa, uh, Lisa, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. We see it. Good deal. Okay. That's much better than looking at me. Okay. So um, first, a little bit about us. Uh, Blunt Mansion Association, uh, we maintain the um, home and territorial capital of uh, Governor William Blunt, uh, North Carolinian, um, who was uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the main driving force behind this, the creation of the state of Tennessee. 
Um, very interesting gentleman, uh, both good and bad things in his life. Um, one of the biggest accomplishments other than helping to create state of Tennessee was signing the U.S. Constitution. We'll talk about that a little bit. So Blunt's born in 1749 in uh, North Carolina, very prominent family, um, and basically works his way up to, um, to being the, the face of the family after his father's death. So he serves in the revolution, um, is part of the Constitutional Convention, as I said, in, um, in Philadelphia, and lobbies and becomes our first and only territorial governor um, to uh, help oversee the creation of the Southwest Territory, the administration of the Southwest Territory, and the creation of the state of Tennessee. So, um, you know, Blunt uh, has his experience with at least two constitutions. So he spends the summer there in Philadelphia, cooped up with all the other gentlemen, um, arguing about uh, the, uh, the, what would be in the, uh, the new constitution. Um, doesn't have a, a, a very you know, big role in it, but uh, does his time and uh, helps represent the, the state of North Carolina, eventually um, signing the document um, uh, along with, um, uh, sorry, uh, along with the other delegates to North Carolina. Um, Southwest Territory, uh, the creation of it uh, really is uh, quite simply North Carolina couldn't over, um, couldn't really administer the lands they had west of the mountains. They had enough trouble with just what is now North Carolina. So to settle their debts with the federal government after the end of the revolution, they basically ceded their Western lands and a new territory was created. It's the territory of the United States south of the river Ohio. Most folks for simplicity just called it the Southwest Territory. Uh, not that long before there had been the Northwest Territory. Um, so this was the logical extension of that. Um, on top of being a uh, territorial governor, he was also the Secretary of Indian Affairs and oversaw the Treaty of Holston in 1791, um, which basically satisfied no one and was broken quite, uh, quite quickly after. Um, the house that Blunt built, and the, the whole reason that we're here in the first place, um, he, uh, he has a house built for him uh, by, um, at least overseen by one of his enslaved builders, a man named Cupid, we believe. And basically builds a small compound uh, here in what was originally called White's Fort and very shortly after becomes known as Knoxville. Never hurts to name a territorial capital after your boss. Henry Knox was Governor Blunt's boss in the, um, uh, in the War Department. So um, the main driving, the main thing that Blunt is here to do is to um, get as many people to move to the territory as quickly as possible, to establish the mechanisms of government here in the territory and to push for statehood. So um, Tennessee is, is kind of unique in this way um, as we did not wait for the, the, the government's permission to become a state, we, did, we just basically declared it on our own. So um, in, uh, uh, in early 1796, or excuse me, 1795, um, Blunt looks like he's about to lose his job, so he really, after the last few years of work, really wants to see the state of Tennessee uh, come into fru you know, come to fruition. So he, recognizing the, that he could potentially lose his job, he pushes forward with um, getting uh, Tennessee, getting the state of Tennessee created. Um, and so they do a survey, uh, excuse me, a census to see if enough people have moved to the territory to push for statehood. Uh, some folks have said the census was fraudulent, it's hard to say, but either way, they, the census did find that there were enough people living in the territory now to be able to consider themselves for statehood. And so Blunt called for a constitutional convention here in Knoxville to take place in early 1796. Overall, the, the, the constitutional convention lasted about a month. There were 55 delegates, all white property owning males, who um, came to Knoxville and um, really hashed out the, the details of what it would take to become a state. Um, I think one of the most interesting parts about it is one of the very first action items, I guess you could say, on the agenda was to give themselves a pay cut. I uh, believe it was $2 a day or something like that for uh, originally for them to be able to come uh, for, the, for, for the convention and they gave themselves, they cut it by about half roughly. I uh, would have a hard time believing that very many politicians today, the very first thing they would do was be vote to give themselves a pay cut. Um, the, uh, some of the, um, 
you know, uh, Blunt oversees the whole process, not really necessarily as Zeller, but sort of the president of the convention, much like Washington did in, in Philadelphia. Although um, Blunt being one for um, uh, working behind the scenes, I'm sure that he, he had no problem letting sympathetic delegates know what he really wanted to see in the document. Um, he was uh, uh, very much a, uh, a businessman masquerading as a politician. You know, and there were, uh, we tend to think of men at this time period as being a little more altruistic because they have wigs and buckle shoes. But in, in reality, the politics was just as sharp elbowed and as dirty and as uh, self-serving as it is nowadays. Um, and so working behind the scenes, Blunt was sure to get, you know, his ideas through. And um, if you read the, the actual minutes of the convention, uh, when they actually bother to show up for work, there are many days they meet and they adjourn very quickly. Um, you know, of the of the total number of days, there are not that many days that they really get down to business and, and dig into the actual work that they're there for. Um, um, they they really hash out uh, a constitution which is uh, quite different than some other states, and um, is actually uh, for what, let me if I can get the quote exactly right. Um, Thomas Jefferson de described it as the least imperfect and most republican of the state constitutions. And so one of the things that makes it different is it's universal suffrage for, for, uh, for uh, property owning males. So um, uh, basically uh, white males and free blacks could vote, which was, a very di was different than a lot of other constitutions, especially in the South. Um, and they were very, um, they were very intent on um, uh, including a bill of rights and making sure that the rights of the citizens were protected much the same way um, as uh, with uh, the Bill of Rights at the federal level, um, which had been um, a, a big point of contention between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Um, Blunt actually had fallen on both sides of the argument and been a Federalist and then very shortly after became an Anti-Federalist. Um, so the, um, uh, the actual text of it uh, of the uh, suffrage, it gives all free men, white and black, 21 years of age, who owned a freehold or had resided in the county uh, six months, the right to vote. So very much uh, uh, progressive by comparison. So, um, sorry, uh, forgive me. Um, so the, um, uh, once the constitution is drafted and the local, Several local historians have said um, that they think that the drafting committee met here in Blunt's office uh, on site um, and um, drafted it, but it was actually signed in uh, Colonel David Henley's office up on Gay Street, uh, which would be one of the corners where the parking lot is next to the Bijou. And we are lucky in the museum to be able to have the desk that the first Tennessee constitution was signed on. This uh, very large um, portable desk uh, belonged to uh, Colonel Henley and Colonel Henley's family uh, donated to the museum in the 1950s. Uh, for the uh, 225th of the state of Tennessee, which was last year, we um, had a local um, craftsman with the name of um, uh, local craftsman to uh, do a complete restoration on the desk. And uh, it's, it's never looked better. It's a, it was a really amazing, uh, amazing project, which if you look on our YouTube and through our Facebook and everything, there's a lot of details on, on how we did that. Um, one of the things that the, um, the, this constitution uh, gave, uh, which is kind of, kind of different and unique, was uh, free navigation of the Mississippi. So Tennessee being landlocked, the only way to be able, and bordered on mountains on the, on the, on the east side, the only way to be able to move large amounts of goods is through our river system much like today, you know, heavy things tend to go float better on water and move better in barges. So the, um, uh, the free, free navigation of the, of the Mississippi was very important, um, which would actually interestingly factor into Blunt's downfall later. Um, uh, Blunt looked out for the uh, rights of land speculators and uh, those who held people in bondage, those enslaved other indiv individuals, slaveholders. Um, through um, basically, basically making sure that the tax climate uh, was favorable for them. And, um, but also um, 
uh, some might say hypocrit hypocritically or paradoxically, um, uh, made sure to um, cover the, uh, the rights of uh, religion, press assembly and speech, much like the, the Federal Bill of Rights did. Um, so quite, a, quite a, an interesting document. Um, Blunt would go on to um, uh, run for uh, governor against John Sevier, but lost and had to settle for being one of our first senators. And this is one of the ways that the, uh, the Tennessee's, uh, you know, uh, push for statehood is quite unique, or at least it, it, not unique, but uh, is a first, is we declared ourselves to be a state. So when the, when the men came together and signed the document, they basically said, we are now the state of Tennessee. They elected um, John Sevier as our first governor and went on to elect William Blunt and William Cock as our first two senators. Um, they tasked them with going to Philadelphia and presenting the, the new constitution and presenting Tennessee as the new state um, and were not necessarily well received. Um, it was going into an election year and the anti-federal, the federalists were not particularly thrilled at the idea of admitting a new state which had a very strong anti-federalist sentiment. Uh, the anti-federalists were very much in favor and so um, basically between February and, and June, um, the Senate provided a chair for Blunt and Cock to sit in and proceeded to debate the merits of letting the state in. So they came to a compromise um, and basically said that um, the, they would allow Tennessee to come in as, as the 16th state as long as they only had one representative. Um, and uh, on June 1st, 1796, Tennessee becomes the uh, 16th state in the union, which we still celebrate as state of day here in Tennessee. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, the, the short version is the end of the, the, the short version of the rest of Blunt's career is very shortly after Tennessee's admittance into the union. Um, he gets himself into some financial trouble um, due to land prices dropping uh, in middle and west Tennessee due to the Spanish and the French making noise like they were going to shut down river traffic on the Mississippi. As I said earlier, this is very important. And with uh, no way to get goods to market, uh, it makes the, the land in west Tennessee especially look very unattractive to potential buyers. Um, the market drops, Blunt loses a lot of money, gets into a very ill-concealed an ill-conceived and ill-concealed conspiracy to invite the British back to North America to take on the Spanish and the French. A lot of folks saw this as treason. Blunt gets caught, um, is impeached by the House, and is uh, essentially thrown out of the Senate. He's expelled from the Senate. Then they try to put him on trial. Blunt flees uh, Philadelphia, uh, comes back to Tennessee, refuses to go back to stand trial, and he has a very simplistic argument uh, that he has his attorneys make uh, to the Senate saying he's not a senator anymore, therefore they don't have the right to try him. Um, after a lot of legal wrangling and arguing, uh, eventually they just kind of have to throw up their hands and just say, we're glad he's gone, we'll handle it different the next time. So um, it's been come up several times since his impeachment uh, in several notable impeachments since that he's, uh, his, his example has been used, so. As a museum, uh, we've been around since 1920. The new organization's been here since 25. The museum opens in 26. And we've been seeing uh, school kids ever since. Our founder, Mary Boyce Temple, um, said uh, she saved uh, the Blunt House from destruction uh, for the children of Knoxville. And we'd like to thank it's for, the, the, for all the kids in the state of Tennessee, amongst others. Um, but what we do nowadays is we talk about the um, we talk about the you know life here on the frontier. We talk about politics. We talk about the enslaved. Um, we can do a, a wide variety of, of uh, programming, uh, both on site and uh, online, uh, for for teachers, depending on uh, what part of state or um, constitutional history they're doing. So. Um, Blunt's office, where I was hoping to be able to sit today, like I said, um, we have the, the Constitution desk, and there's something really uh, kind of amazing about being able to get, to get the kids in and talk about um, Tennessee history, Constitution history, uh, in a place where these things really happen. Um, and uh, it's, always, it's always interesting to, especially um, uh, 
our fourth graders and fifth graders. Uh, they're at such an amazing uh, time in their life that, uh, you know, you can show them just about anything and they're fascinated by it. Um, and so it's, it's, really, um, it's really fun engaging with them uh, in these spaces and being able to, to see those, you know, that recognition and those bells going off about, oh, you know, um, you know I've heard about this, but now I'm really seeing it. It's, it's kind of amazing. Um, we also uh, use our garden as a teaching tool. The Knoxville Garden Club has been maintaining our gardens for uh, since 1934. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, and they just keep getting better every year. Um, and we use them as a teaching tool as well, because, you know, even if it's not necessarily exactly what the bloods had, a lot of the plants are native, a lot of the plants are medicinal, um, and it gives us some really amazing ways to talk about um, how, you know, uh, medicinal herbs were used, how kitchen herbs were used, um, and is, is, a, is just a, a beautiful teaching tool in and of itself. So, um, one of the things that has been a, a real focus and um, you really have Lisa to thank about this in a lot of ways, is to making sure that in the stories that we're telling, um, that we are or we, we're talking about, uh, we're, we're really talking about the enslaved. So, you know, Lisa did some very groundbreaking research um, back in the, in the 90s, and really um, her, her work really predates a lot of the, the, the large historic house museums like uh, Mount Vernon or Monticello from, you know, um, the work that they're doing now is fantastic, but she predates them by decades. So we are very lucky that um, she took an interest in our site and uh, the enslaved peoples here. And we've um, found out um, a lot through archeology span and through, um, through her uh, research. And we're always finding new things. So um, as you can see here, we found in one of our bricks, the fingerprints of an enslaved brick maker. Um, and it's, it's amazing. You can still see the fingerprints in, in the, you know, actually the actual swirls in the, in the brick itself. And it's, it's it really kind of puts it into perspective because it's either a small woman or a child's hands. And when you see that, it really is just sort of, a, a, you know, a link uh, to, to the past and the people who were here um, who really hadn't had a voice uh, until a lot more recently. Same thing with, uh, like I said, with, uh, Lisa's research, you know, we're finding names, we're finding ways to connect family members, because I think it's important to understand that, you know, uh, the blood flaming didn't just enslave individuals, they enslave family units. Um, and so the more that you can make these connections for the students, the more that you can, um, uh, you know, tell these stories, uh, the more real it is for them and the, and the more that it sticks. And just like I said, with the archaeology, they've done field schools. It's been a while, but they've done field schools here um, to, to discover a lot uh, of information that we can combine with the primary uh, source research and, and really get uh, an idea of what life was like for everyone here in the 18th century. So, um, so one of the things that we, we love um, when, we're, when, we, when we have large groups is um, to be able to combine the lessons on the political climate in the 18th century with a hands-on lesson with them being able to use quill pens um, and, uh, and be able to, 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 to write in that late 18th century way. Um, the kids absolutely love it. Same thing with uh, being able to do hands-on cooking demonstrations. Um, a lot of times we'll get the kids in, we'll make some Johnny cakes and you know, nothing sort of focuses the mind uh, of young folks uh, like food and you know, feeding them something sweet in the morning really never hurts. And they uh, jump in and they, uh, you know, we uh, let them do the, the safer parts of it, but we don't let them get near the fire. <laughs> so um, like I said, we use the, the gardens as a teaching tool. A garden club a lot of times comes and they do special programming on plants for the kids about plant blindness, helping the kids recognize you know, the state flowers, state trees, these kinds of things. So, um, but also one thing um, that I wanted to, to, to offer um, is the, um, we can remote in um, through Zoom um, and my education coordinator does it quite often, uh, Joshua Renner, um, is we can remote into your classroom and we can do activities with, with the students. Um, we'll, you know, he has uh, PowerPoints that, where he can deal with a lot of different topics and then has activities to go along with it. Uh, for instance, um, you know, we do, like I said, do one on the Constitution um, and then do quill pen writing. Um, we do, you know, guided, guided exercises and then guided with the, with the, the, the quill pens. Um, 
and um, well, I thought we had a picture. My bad. Um, we have a whole um, lesson plan on flags. Um, you know, talking about the early uh, the early sixteen or fifteen star um, uh, you know American flag, um, the Tennessee tri star. We do a lot of these kinds of things, um, as well as. Um, uh, lessons on journalism. Um, we do women's suffrage. Uh, we've done stuff on women's suffrage. We can do women's history topics. And one thing we, we always um, try to stress is that if the teacher has a need, we want to fill it. And um, we've, we've gotten grant funding from Humanities Tennessee. So like Lisa said, a big thanks to Humanities Tennessee for helping make a lot of different education opportunities possible, as well as the state, uh, state of Tennessee uh, through the Tennessee Historical Commission, um, and then both of our local uh, uh, city and county governments have provided funding for us to be able to do, um, essentially just to be at the service of, the, of, of um, our local teachers, but also teachers statewide. So if, um, you know, if somebody in the middle of West Tennessee who has no physical way of getting here at a reasonable time, wants us to be able to do programming on blunt, uh, on the enslaved, constitutions, any of these things, we love to craft um, you know, uh, an opportunity to, to get in front of your students and do something um, both informative and hands-on um, uh, to, uh, to help, um, you know, to help make things easier uh, on the teachers. Um, the same thing too, um, we're, we're very happy to kind of be outside of our bubble too. So if you have a need of something that doesn't relate to the 18th century, we're happy to do that. So, um, you know, we're all historians. We all have the ability to, to to you know, do other programming and look forward to it. We had a teacher recently that needed a lesson on um, the Corps of Discovery. So Joshua put together a program on uh, Lewis and Clark that was very, very well received. So um, I see Lisa popping up. Is there anything else you want me to cover? Anything I missed? There was a, qu there was a question. Okay. How many enslaved people lived at what mansion? Um, okay, so at a, as a sort of a snapshot, um, when we have when, when we have the most of the information from the Blunts in total own somewhere near or enslaved somewhere near 27 people, the best we know. Now, as far as how many people are actually on site or in Knoxville, we think it's somewhere around 10 based on the available evidence. So there's a core group of, of enslaved men and women and children who live here and, and work on the property. We think there were probably several others who were working on a farm um, where the University of Tennessee is now. Blunt had several hundred acres there, kind of in the main part of campus. Um, but it's um, somewhere near 10, probably here in, in Knoxville. So. Does anybody have another question that they wanna post or they're, they're just dying to ask? Is there anything else you wanted me to cover? I'm not sure if I got it, if I nailed I it. I think all. you've done, I think you've done a great job. Um, I know that you're going to be hanging on and, for a little bit anyway, and then need to scoot out. So again, I just want to say a few words about what I've posted. And then if there are questions, I encourage folks to share here. Perhaps um, Dave, you can put your email address or whatever contact that you want folks to use. I did post your website. Excellent. So in the chat box, perhaps any, any way that you want folks to contact you or Joshua um, to take care of anything with education. Just going back in the chat box, I wanted to make sure that folks saw that um, I did post the website for Blunt Mansion. Um, also for Tennessee History Day, for um, National History Day information that folks might want, or the Discover Tennessee History Conference. So you might have to scroll back for that. There is also a link um, for the Tennessee Historical Society's founding documents, primary source set, exhibit, however you want to call it, it's online. Um, that link is there and you can see actual copies there that are um, typically they have transcriptions, they have digital versions that you can embed into your presentations, into your slides or whatever. Um, as far as the primary sources, you can go to that link and find those sources. Um, oh, what is the best way to set up a field trip? Um, I'll post my contact info and Joshua's contact info in here. Um, and, um, you know, basically you can always email us, you can call us. Um, we're happy, we're happy to help. And um, as I said, you know, we can, we can, if, if you're local, we're happy to have you here. 
um, if you're if you're close, we can always come to you. Um, and if you're in other parts of the state, we can remote in pretty much uh, um, with uh, you know <laughs> with, with setting up a time. We're we're happy to remote in as well. So I'll post all that in the chat. And then anybody that wants to get a hold of us or needs help with absolutely anything, please feel free. Okay. Well, um, hold on just a second there and have your camera on because I wanted to invite um, our next presenter to see if he had any questions for you, Dave. Um, but just to give Dr. Hardy a, a moment to let him know that he's about to, to come up to bat, literally, is considering he's involved in the vintage baseball um, team here in Knoxville, but um, as Doc Hardy. But anyway, um, so William, anything that you had a question for I do, Dave? Before, I yeah. do have a question for Dave, uh, for David, and in regards to that relic, that 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 piece of rich Tennessee history that they have there at Blunt Mansion, David Henley's desk. Yeah. And um, I'm just curious, where that? What's the history of that desk? I mean, I know. Historians debate upon whether you know the Constitution was written, signed in both places, Blunt Mansion, David Henley's office. It's obviously signed on his desk, and he's his office was there at the 700 block of Gay Street on the west side. Um, what is the history after? How did that desk come to be at Blunt Mansion? Um, well, it looks like based on the information. I can't lay hands on it right away, but the uh, the descendants of David Henley, um, we have a whole packet of letters and provenance from them that this was his desk and was the desk that he said the Tennessee Constitution was signed on. Um, it looks like it was made back east, possibly somewhere, maybe Maryland, Baltimore, I believe that's where he'd come from, um, and had come with him to the territory. The um, something we had just found out recently it's actually it's two pieces um and the top part was henley's and then the bottom part was a stand that they had had made for it to be able to use it so the top part is a very large traveling desk the bottom is a stand made for it um sometime in the early 1800s very early um so the family says that it was in there it was in his possession and then they were able to trace which family members had it and they brought it to us in the 1950s early 1950s i believe um and as i said it was it was directly from his descendants and um they said uh, basically signed off on it and said it was what he had said was the one that was signed on wasn't there a youtube video i thought i recall seeing someone when they were working on it that actually showed the restoration is that available on your all's website or it's on it's on our youtube page actually um michael jordan our, our current director of, of marketing and, and development um, was a documentarian and was very excited about being able to spend time with James and showed his process and the parts that he had um, had to restore. It was damaged by some thieves in 1955, right, not that long after we got it, and they had done some repairs on it, but he was really putting it back the way uh, it had been um, when um, uh, at least uh, early on in its life. So he, there was some, some, some care issues with the top part and then the bottom part had actually originally been um, almost like a filing cabinet had pull out big deep pull out drawers and everything that he restored um, and it's uh, it's on our it's on our web it's on our uh, as well as other remember, resources I couldn't remember I think I'm friends with Michael on Facebook and then maybe he shared it there and I was just thinking that might be a fascinating uh, clip for the teachers to see absolutely there's several he's got there's a there's a tour that Michael did of the house there's several other um, several other things that he's done on some of our artifacts and things like that that are that are uh, might be fun to use in the classroom and we also you know would uh, be happy to, to help present them if necessary or if desired you know that um james hooper that worked on the desk is just an incredible craftsman and um restorationist conservator so it's really been well taken care of. And if he says it dates from the time period, I mean, that's one of the best, best connections um, for him to look at it and say that the story matches the piece. Of course, we would never really know. Um, it's wonderful to have primary sources all the way back to the time when an art connected to an artifact, but that's rare. But this is a case of a lot of the pieces there um, at Blunt Mansion, you've, you've been able to use them just as illustrations of what the Blunts would have. But in this case, it's something from the community. So. Um, Dave, I really, really appreciate it. 
um, just make sure you put your contact in the chat box so folks can get in touch with you. And thank you, thank you so much. And hopefully you'll you'll have a, a great rest of the summer and we'll all look forward to seeing you in the fall with our with our kiddos. So thank That's you perfect. so much. Let us know what we can do for you guys. I'll put, uh, put the contact yep. info there now. Okay, thank you. All right. So now we go on and I know most folks have videos off. So I wanna encourage you, please do not leave. We want you to listen, but I know you might need to stand up and stretch for a moment as I introduce um, our next speaker. And Dr. William Hardy and I have known each other for a while um, and we've worked together on some incredible projects, including about three consecutive Teaching American History grants when Dr. Hardy was our scholar instructor and coordinator of those grants, working with many teachers from across our region. And I think that he would agree that we learned a lot from you all. We, we apprenticed <laughs> and, and learned an incredible, um, incredible amount from the teachers we worked with over basically almost 11 years. So anyway, he has gone on to um, continue his career as a scholar of Lincoln history, Civil War history, American history in general. And now I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about his position at Lincoln Memorial University, where he has just accepted a new position and um, a very recognized uh, title and position there. And he can be a great resource for you as well as he's, he's had his foot into that high school arena um, as a secondary educator. And so I really look forward because this is right in his wheelhouse. This is something that um, looking at the Tennessee constitution at our governmental history, political history, and with a specialty in antebellum history. So the 1870 constitution is something that he has um, been very close to over his academic work and his dissertation work. So I'm gonna hand it over, over to Dr. Hardy, let him continue the introduction as he sees fit and to talk about the 1830s and 1870s and the amendments that came out of those, those decades. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Hardy. Well, good morning, everyone. Hopefully I'm able to be heard and, and seen for now. Um, I'll eventually put a PowerPoint up here when I get Roaring, roaring here and uh, you won't have to look at this. Um, but yeah, I've worked with uh, Lisa and we worked at East Tennessee Historical Society for eight years and worked on Teach American History grants and multiple teacher workshops and National History Day, which was a passion of mine. Um, and I originally started out wanting to be a history teacher. I just loved history. It was one of those rare birds that just took to history at early age. And uh, it tended to be a high school history teacher probably, don't know, maybe middle school, um, but got into college and uh, professors sent me down to the dark side, the dark path um, of the force and went into uh, college and got my master's and PhD. And after a long time now, I've uh, accepted a full-time position as assistant professor at Lincoln Memorial University and uh, with the title of Lincoln Scholar. So really cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my eyes on here. I'm going to see if I can get this to share. I am not the best with technology, so I'm going to rely on Lisa or Rebecca to help let me know if you all can see. Yep, I see the PowerPoint. it. It's in its full screen. Look at that. Uh, it's awesome. good. Cool. Okay, um, so today I'll be talking about Tennessee's 1834 and 1870 constitutions. Um, you know, hey, the Constitution legal history usually isn't the most exciting part of history. My students, uh, anytime we talk about legal documents, they get bored and their eyes glaze over. And, you know, we gotta, we gotta make our students understand constitutional issues affect all of us. And, you know, whether wherever you stand these days, constitutional issues are a buzz and, and are critical to our nation's history. You can connect what's going on now with our past as constitutional histories, uh, uh, constitutions um, and the rights that uh, have been won and sometimes taken away in our history. And we'll see that 
in these constitutions we talked about today. I've got the Tennessee state uh, standards that uh, the 34 and 70 constitutions appear in, and they appear in uh, you know the the, the great various grade levels. Um, so let me just jump in and. Usually in the classroom, I like to engage in, in, in my, with my students in discussion. And I'm just gonna go off the bat here and we'll just sort of see if, if, if this works. Um, and as I work through these two constitutions, I've got key points. It may look like death by PowerPoint on some of these slides, but it's really just the edited portions of the key provisions of the constitution, the article and section that I've teased out. Um, of these documents that relate to these key points. And with both constitutions, I'm gonna start with historical context. You must understand what's going on at the time, um, that it is um, important to understand what's going on at the time um, in terms of American history. Um, so I will ask, in 1834, when the Tennessee state constitution, the second state constitution is written, we are in an era that historians either label the antebellum era or Jacksonian America, Jacksonian democracy. Does anybody just want to chime in and tell me what what do you think of when you when you think of Jacksonian democracy? What comes to mind? What are what what do you teach about Jacksonian democracy with your students? And why don't we just post any comments you have in the chat box if can you see the chat box, Dr. Hardy? Uh, I can bring it up. Yes. Okay, good. I, start, I see Zach and, and uh, Brewer. I, I just see BT, but I'll go with Brewer. Um, uh, I see patronage. That is the awarding of political uh, offices to those who have worked on your behalf, who support you. Expansion of voting rights, dropping of the property requirements. These are excellent. Um, do, do you consider... Jacksonian democracy, Jacksonian era to be an advancement of democracy, positive good, or maybe restricting or um, some obstructions to democracy. Rebecca chimes in, still no votes for women. Excellent. That's not exactly a positive aspect of the era. Any other thoughts? I'll go ahead and, and, and reflect back to uh, obstructions. Um, I'll reflect back to my own teaching or, or, or when I was in the classroom uh, going up through elementary, well, I don't really remember as much elementary, but middle and, and high school history, and then into the college classroom is I was always taught Jacksonian era was this positive, good, this advancement of democracy, sort of following um, an arc of history, a linear movement towards progress in our nation's history. Um, Jacksonian era has come under a lot of criticism since the 1970s, uh, post since 1970s for sort of the obstructions to democracy in terms of, as Rebecca says, still no votes for women, uh, the plight of Native Americans in this country uh, during that period sort of it is it's maybe two steps forward one step back or one step forward two steps back and we'll see that with this constitution um so, so the era is important to note and uh i love to do artwork in class and this is a uh, george caleb bingham's the county election there's a lot you can do with this to engage your students about the era that it represents jacksonian democracy and the people and there's there's news uh, papers uh, being distributed among the people and we're getting prepared for the election here. There's a lot of great stuff going on in here. Not upholding the constitution, excellent point there. Um, so let's just dive in here um, with historical context. Um, if we go to the 1820s, just right before the decade before what we're talking about, the Const 1834 constitution, American political culture and its deference to a ruling class of elites will begin to gradually give way to a democratic urges of the citizenry and a new political culture that was based more on the will of the majority as opposed to the minority, those who had been in power. Political parties and its leaders rose to popularity by championing the will of the people, pushing the country toward a future in which a wider 
swath of citizens gained a political voice. The spirit of dem democratic reform became most evident in the widespread belief that all white men, regardless of whether they owned property, had the right to participate in elections. However, as it's been noted in the chat array, this expansion of political power was limited to white men, women and blacks, free and enslaved, as well as Native Americans remained or grew increasingly disfranchised by the American political system. Now, during this period, as voting became less connected to wealth, one sex and race ended up replacing these property qualifications, which were dropped as a criterion for voting rights. When the various states rewrote their constitutions, and that's been something that I, I was taught very early on, the Jacksonian era was that all the states rewrote their constitutions, and they did during this period, but we're going to look into it a little bit more exactly what was going on. But when these states rewrote their constitutions during this early 1800s, to expand suffrage to all white men, some added in new restrictions, preventing women and African-Americans from voting. The state legislature of New Jersey, which had permitted wealthy unmarried women to vote since the revolution, limited suffrage to men in 1807. Moreover, this new American democracy had a decidedly racist orientation. White male majorities began limiting and restricting the rights of black minorities. Uh, in the early 1800 Northern states, which had permitted free black citizens to vote before, began stripping them of that privilege, or they added property and tax paying requirements so high that they effectively barred free African-Americans from voting. The United States transformation into a republic where nearly all adult white men could vote was incredibly progressive for its time. The extent of American democracy and the enthusiasm with which Americans participated in elections amazed European observers. People came like Tocqueville to observe democracy in action in the 1830s in America. Nowhere else in the world could such a large proportion of the population exercised the franchise and exercise it they did, white males, once they got the vote. In the 1840 presidential election, 79% of eligible American voters turned out to vote. This is an era when there's, it's typical to see 80%, maybe a little bit higher of the eligible voters participating which is a sad tell when we look at where we are in modern America where so many people do not participate, do not educate themselves in our, in our civics. But let's get to the 1834 constitution now in Tennessee. Why was there a need for a new state constitution? Uh, David told us before that um, Thomas Jefferson had actually called Tennessee's 1796 state constitution the least imperfect, the most republic of all of the constitutions of the various states. Why then some, let's see, 40, math is hard for historians, uh, 40 or no, 38 years later after the first state constitution, why did a new one need to be written? Well, by 1840, by 1834, there were a number of factors contributing to the push for the need for a new state constitution. Tennessee had moved from the status of a frontier state in 1796 forward into a stabilized society now, emphasizing both agriculture and commerce. And in terms of the influx of people, Tennessee was a booming state. Between 1800 and 1833, the population of, in, of Tennessee increased sixfold from 105,000 602 people in 1800 to in 1833, 681,902 people. Now, while Tennessee expanded six fold during this 33 year period, the rest of the nation only expanded double, they only doubled. So Tennessee is booming as people are moving West. Thus, Tennessee is experiencing a variety of pressures within that led to this Constitutional Convention of 1834. The immediate sources of contention included a desire to reform both the state's tax laws 
and its judicial system, the latter of which was denounced as, quote, the most expensive and least efficient of any of the judiciaries in the United States. As early as the economic crisis of 1819, voices were raised on behalf of a new constitutional convention to amend the state's antiquated founding document, now only 38 years old. However, or I'm sorry, in 1819, it's only you know, 23 years old. They're calling that antiquated. However, even in that critical year of 1819, the voters soundly defeated a proposal for a constitutional convention. A decade later, the General Assembly passed a resolution providing yet again for a vote by the people to decide on a constitutional convention. The vote was closer, but still failed. The General Assembly, looking at the vote being so close now in 18, uh, uh, 1821 or 1831, they decided in 1833 to hold yet another vote on a constitutional convention. And in 1833, the voters favored a call for a convention, and thus a le the legislature set the first week of March 1834 as the time for the election of delegates to a convention. They elected it, some 60 delegates, who met in Nashville on May the 19th, 1834, to begin to devise a new instrument of government for Tennessee. Now, unlike their 1796 predecessors, predecessors like William Blunt and Andrew Jackson, who was also at that convention, they had only taken four weeks to draft the 1796 Constitution. The 1834 convention, however, would need 14 weeks. There was a lot of work to be done. Now, again, we think of democracy, Jacksonian democracy as we want to expand the suffrage. Well, Perhaps the most significant reason for this convention in the first place was increasing, was to, uh, was to reform the tax laws in Tennessee. There was an increasing uproar among East and West Tennesseans over the basis on which property, particularly land, was taxed. There was a growing disparity in land values between townships and rural tracts, between developed and undeveloped lands all of which according to the 1796 convention or constitution were taxed at the same rate. By this time, a vocal majority of the Tennessean public were publicly calling for taxation to be based on the value of the property as it would be assessed, an indication of a manifestation of the democratic impulses of the time, the people rising up calling for the legislature to take action, in this case, get the convention, uh, call for a constitutional convention, then get these delegates to make sure property is assessed by its value. The tax provisions were changed to allow taxation on land, bank stock, slaves between the ages of 12 and 50, and other property that the legislature might deem appropriate, all according to value. So when you look at the 1834 Constitutional Convention, it's tax reform. And when we think about money, every time we think about voting, money and our situation and the economy is always king in, 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 in how we approach a lot of the issues. It may not be the only obviously issue, but it's key. And that's what was driving uh, Tennesseans primarily was tax reform, but it wasn't the only reform. Judicial reform was key on the minds of Tennesseans. In 1834, this is the third key point here, establishing an independent judiciary. In 1834, Tennessee's judiciary was in crisis and desperately in need of reform. Since its inception, over the course of nearly 40, four decades, Tennessee's courts were under the legislature's control. Perhaps the gravest defect of the 1796 Constitution was that it failed to heed the unique American idea of government as established in our U.S. Constitution. That is, our system of three coordinate branches of government, our three branches of government. The U.S. Supreme Court in our Constitution is independent of both Congress and the President, and there is no power in Congress to coerce. And yet 
Tennessee's founding fathers in 1796, some nine years removed from the United States Constitution, they opted to create its courses, its courts by legislative act, thus depriving the judiciary of being an independent body. And thus, the judiciary was constantly host held hostage by state legislators. They were riddled with incompetent judges, besieged by several impeachment trials to remove judges behaving badly. The delegates to the 1834 convention thus established a jud judiciary as an independent branch of government. They vested powers in one Supreme Court with three judges to represent each of the competing geographical divisions of the state, East, Middle, and West. And they term limited the, judge, the judges with varying years based on the court. So the Supreme Court was held to a 12 year term, the lower courts to an eight year term and state attorneys to a six year term. So that's another, right off the bat, the reason for this constitutional convention, uh, we're not talking about expanding suffrage yet. We're looking at reform, tax, tax reform and judicial reform. A fourth key point I wanna throw in, not that it's the most significant, but it's something that's not necessarily Jacksonian or at least favored by the Democrats, more of a Whig philosophy is internal improvements, something that we now know as infrastructure. It's always, I always ask my students trying to get them to think of internal improvements and you got to get them to think of infrastructure and maybe they've heard that word and we've heard that word for those who are tuned to politics the last several years, but the roads and bridges, clearing rivers, obstructions, building canals and railroad development. This is very expensive. And Tennessee was actually rather progressive on this issue. One of the more interesting parts of the 1834 constitution that is not often talked about, it's not in the state standards, but I feel like it's important I need to talk about because it's something you talk about in the classroom, it's covered anyway in other standards, is internal improvements. It's not part of the Jacksonian political agenda, but rather a fundamental part of the agenda of the Whigs, their opponents, the Henry Clay's American system hits upon one of the key themes of the Annabelle Romero, one of the most important of all the revolutions in American history, and that is the transportation revolution. In Article 11, Section 9, it states a well-regulated system of internal improvements is calculated to develop the resources of the state and promote the happiness and prosperity of her citizens. Therefore, it ought to be encouraged by the General Assembly. This statement being included in the state constitution reflected a swelling tide of interest in improving transportation facilities. The roads, the bridges, the clearing the rivers and the burgeoning railroad uh, fervor that I talked about that not only captivated Tennesseans across each division but also all Americans in the early, still early 19th century. The problem is much of the opposition that existed in state legislatures across the nation uh, to internal improvements usually come from the fear of saddling their states with huge debts that would require more taxation. Uh, but Tennessee was very progressive in doing that. And again, the Constitutional Convention of 1834 is driven by East and West Tennesseans. West Tennesseans are desperate to have uh, networks of transportation to, to facilitate trade and such out to them and back eastward. And East Tennesseans are desperately, uh, once the 1830s come on the scene, are, in, are eager to start building railroads and will build the Georgia um, and East Tennessee and the East Tennessee Virginia Railroad connecting in Knoxville, Tennessee in the 1850s. Um, so that's a, a, another key point that is uh, not in the standards and not, not usually talked about with the 1834 constitution. Now let's get to the biggie. Key point number five, suffrage. Property qualifications and voting and holding office in terms of qualifications. Now, prior to the 1820s, many state constitution had imposed either property and or tax paying qualifications for voting as a mean to keep democratic impulses in check. However, as federalist ideas fell out of favor, ordinary white men from the middle and lower classes increasingly questioned the idea that one's financial status was an indication of virtue. They argued for universal manhood suffrage or voting rights for all white male adults. 
And one of the more interesting aspects when you look at uh, state voting requirements is that all of the new states admitted to the union after 1789, once we be, the federal government is inaugurated, all of these new states in their constitutions did not contain uh, a, um, they, they did not contain a property qualification for voting. Um, in most cases, but not all, they did not even contain a tax paying qualification for voting. Now, Tennessee did have a, a minor property qualification of being a freehold and residing for uh, uh, six months in the state. Um, but actually in tax paying, Tennessee was very, rather progressive. They were the fourth state in the union uh, to abolish um, or never have a, um, in our case, a tax paying requirement following the lead of Maryland in 1776, Vermont in 1786, and my home state, Kentucky, when it was admitted to the union in 1792. Now, while many states retain a tax paying requirement for voting, 15 of the 24 states in 1834 had already eliminated property qualification for voting. So Tennesseans went to work and in the Constitutional Convention of 1834, they dropped, dumped the property qualification for voting and also for those who hold elective office. And once they drop the property qualification, you see the number of votes uh, expand in Tennessee. If you look at the 1833 general election prior to the convention uh, for, uh, for the governor race, there's 54,000 votes. In 1835, when you have the first election for a governor um, post the constitution with the expansion of uh, with the property qualifications dropped, it goes from 54,641 votes in 1833 to 85,503 votes in 1835, with some 80% of Tennesseans participating in the election, which mirrors what's going on across the nation. Now, who has the suffrage and who does not have the right to vote? Well, heading into the 1834 convention, while most of the discussion centered around tax and judiciary reform and whether to drop the property requirement for voting, there has been little talk of emancipation of slavery and the status of free blacks who, as David noted by the 1796 constitution, could vote in Tennessee. Um, however, in the convention, once the debate started, discussion slavery and race soon took center stage as the question of who has and who does not have the right to vote became hot topics. Um, a quick little context here. Three years before this convention in 1831, you've got Nat Turner's rebellion in Virginia, and you also have the appearance of William Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. And this has a, a, an, a burgeoning abolitionist movement north of the Mason-Dixon line, which plays a role in this discussion of the status of slavery and, in this context, free Blacks, because Interestingly, when the discussion started, a number of delegates came out in favor of stripping free blacks of their constitutional right to vote. Um, in, uh, on June 28th, William Loving of Haywood County claimed he was, quote, truly astonished and regretted to see old gray-headed gentlemen arguing in favor of granting free blacks the right to vote, which was the highest right and privilege in a free government. He went on to characterize free black voters as an evil example to our slaves of an incalculable extent. According to Lovin, when a slave saw a free black exercise the right to vote, well, they looked at them, they see no difference in color and moral or even intellectual advancement. According to Loving, he believed that black suffrage only awakened and excited feelings in slaves of a most delicate nature, embracing within their range the overthrow or total extinction of the right, white race. And what Loving does do, he's saying the quiet out loud, the quiet part out loud, is this fear, this racist undertones at this period of black advancement. And suddenly there becomes a move to block free black voting in the, in the convention. A motion was inserted uh, to insert the word white immediately after free to determine who could vote over the age of 21 years of age. And suddenly now all white males over the age of 21 can vote, but once they inserted white, they stripped free blacks of the right to vote, which goes to show 
it is still a play on Martin Luther King Jr.'s word about the arc of history um, bending towards moral justice, so to speak. It shows our arc of history here does not necessarily bend towards justice. It sometimes bends in an opposite direction as a restriction of a constitutional right was stripped of free blacks. Um, further to go ahead, oh, and I should also say that they, in article two, section two, and I've got all this written here on the screen to give you the key passages as it relates, is a law was passed to exclude the right of suffrage for those who've been convicted of infamous crimes, which will be part of Tennessee history and a more controversial, even up to more recent times of what is the row of felons? Should they be able to vote? And once they had stripped the right to vote to from blacks, uh, free blacks, the question of emancipation came up. There had been a brief spell in which um, the uh, people of um, East Tennessee, most prominently, were um, uh, supportive of abolition. And um, there was an effort in this delegate, uh, this convention, there was almost a split between those who were fighting for emancipation versus those who uh, were against it. And John McKinney here uh, gave a speech. He was part of a committee that explored emancipation because people, the various counties started sending emancipation memorials to the convention to consider um, abolishing slavery. McKinney uh, got up and, and spoke in regard to that. And he said slavery was a question which the wisest heads and most benevolent hearts have not been able to answer in a satisfactory manner. The gates of society are just as effectively barred against him after he becomes a free man as while he is a real slave. An inevitable as is the condition of a slave, unlovely as slavery is in all its respects, aspects, his condition is better than the condition of the free man of color in the midst of a community of white men with whom he has no common interest, no fellow, fellow feeling, no equality. The slave is almost wholly exempt from care when his day's work is done. He lies down and sleeps soundly. He knows not at any time what is to hear his children ask for bread when he has none to give them. They too are provided for. There's echoings of paternalism in here and um, or, or, uh, yeah, paternalism. And um, again, the, um, the tactics of those who will um, sort of strengthen the bonds of slavery in the South or play out here. And it ends up in this convention, a vote is taken to um, emanci uh, to call the question about emancipation. And let me make sure I've got this slide here. And I know I am running a little long here. Um, Article two, section 31 is the key point here is emancipation. The General Assembly um, spoke to this question that they have no power to pass laws for the emancipation of slaves without the consent of their owner or owners. Uh, this was a very uh, close vote in itself, uh, 33 to 30 to 27, to a ready, uh, to pass on emancipation. So it's interesting how this convention uh, discussed these issues. Now, Lisa, can you chime in and tell me about time? I know I'm running tight. Yeah. So go ahead and take about 10 minutes for 1870. Okay. And then we'll take some questions, but we do have a question as you're getting, as you're advancing and, and thinking about that. But yeah, we probably have about 10, 15 more minutes um, until we go into Rebecca's piece. But sure. you do have a question just for clarification. So free black Americans were still allowed to vote according to the 1834 question. I mean, constitution, and that's a question. No question mark. Uh, the 1796 Constitution in Tennessee granted free blacks the right to vote, but the 1834 Tennessee Constitution then stripped free blacks right. of the right to vote, making suffrage a qualification only for white males over the age of 21, and there were no property qualifications and no taxpaying qualifications at that time. Um, and that's also when a lot, that's when a lot of the folks that were pro-manumission and some of our abolitionists then leave the state and go to Ohio. So they that, do. that is that, significant. That, yeah, yeah, that fervor just sort of, unfortunately at that point for abolitionists cause uh, waned, as Lisa said, people left the state and um, fear of paranoia began to grip people throughout the South over slavery and, and protecting it. 
And that's that's the case across the board. But Tennessee was very progressive in, in granting free blacks the right to vote in 1796, but stripped in 1834. Uh, the 1870 Constitution, and I'll and I'll I'll go quick here. And and again, I'll put my email in here. If anyone ever has any questions, I'm happy to discuss with you um, the um, uh, particular points. Uh, 1870 historical context, there's a lot going on. The American Civil War has ended. Um, the Unionists in Tennessee have prevailed. They immediately come to power under William Brownlow, who's often portrayed um, negative in Tennessee history, um, probably deserves a more uh, fresh biography to highlight a little more, uh, more positive aspects of his rule. Um, even though there are some negative aspects as well. But that's, that's a story for another day. Um, when Brownlow and the Unionists came into power, uh, they were branded by their opponents as radical Republicans, almost um, sort of blurring the lines between what's going on Tennessee Republicanism with national. And I like to always sort of make it a distinction that national radical Republicans are a little different than Tennessee radical Republicans. Brownlow doesn't exactly prescribe to everything the national radical Republicans did, but they came to power. They immediately disfranchised all rebels, those who had fought for the Confederacy, those who had served in official capacities, those who had sympathized with the Confederacy. They were stripped of their right to vote under the 1865 constitutional amendment to the Constitution. Not a constitution, but a, an amendment, constitutional amendment. So suddenly now white males, who had had the right to vote either in 18 or either in 1796 constitution or the 1834 constitution had their right to vote stripped based upon their uh, treason in fighting against the United States going to war against the United States in the American Civil War so we have constitutional rights being deprived just like free blacks were in 1834 and they Im implement a series of, of strict voting laws who can vote they begin even restricting votes of those who had supported the union, who had sort of began to oppose Brownlow's form of republicanism in Tennessee. Um, they uh, called out state militia to put down Ku Klux Klan and violent reactionaries. They used the state militia uh, against their political opponents. Um, a series of things. One of the more positive aspects is a common school law was passed in 1867, which really put together a, a nice piece of machinery to help educate not just whites, but blacks who were also now enfranchised. Black males were re-enfranchised in 1866. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing around here in my head, I'm sorry. Um, but 1866 uh, in Tennessee, African-Americans were given the right to vote, uh, men. And while the whites, former rebels are disfranchised and that causes a lot of anger among the people of the, who had supported the Confederacy, who had fought for the Confederacy. And through various means, Brownlow would leave the governorship, go to the United States Senate. He turned over the keys to Tennessee's government, its election machinery to a man named DeWitt Clinton Center, who didn't prescribe to Brownlow's more extreme views of punishing the former Confederates. He want, had a more moderate idea. He wanted to bring both sides together, work with those on both sides, who were the unionists, who, who were the former Democrats, the former rebels, more moderate middle road people and sort of alienate the extremists on both sides. Unfortunately for center, um, the extremists on the former Confederate side played along with center. They played good. They um, said what he basically wanted them to do. And they um, cozied up to him and center began using the election machinery in the state that Brownlow had created to appoint commissioners of registrations in the counties, which oversaw who got the right to vote. And center's own people in the counties began giving the right to vote to those who had formerly been, who had been unionists, who had kind of branched off from Brownlow and gone to sympathize more with the 
former Confederates, gave them the right to vote. These were known as conservative. And they got in power in 1869 and immediately turned toward the former Confederates. And they said, if we get in power, we'll give universal male suffrage in the state. And the and we'll call a state constitution in 1870. And so there's tension in this convention between um, conservatives who are now in control, who are moderate, middle of the road people, and the hardline former Confederate rebel democratic leaders who want to really use this constitution to punish Brownlow and his supporters, the former unionists. And there's this constant action of we got to go, we got to play very moderate here. We don't want to make too many radical changes because the authorities in Washington are watching us. And if we do too drastic action, they're going to step in and put us under military reconstruction. What's unusual here is Tennessee was never under military reconstruction. They weren't part of the Reconstruction Acts because as a unionist state, they came in as a loyalist uh, government in 1865. They avoided the uh, Reconstruction in 1866, formally ratified the 13th, 14th Amendment, get into the Union, readmitted back to Union. And so they avoided it. So they want to be very moderate, don't do anything that's going to cause any issues. And um, when they get to suffrage, it's, it's point blank. We're going to restore the right to vote to all former rebels. We're going to basically restore the right to vote to all white males over the age of 21. That's easy. But then there becomes a fight over universal male suffrage, in meaning Blacks. Well, African Americans had been enfranchised under Brownlow's Republican rule. Well, now some of the hardliners countered and said, no, we're going to take the right to vote away from them. And there's this huge back and forth between the moderates and the former, I call unrepentant rebels, hardliners, who basically say, look, this government is for the white man, his posterity forever. We can't give the right to vote to blacks. They're inferior. And the moderates had to sort of amass a coalition uh, to defeat these. There was a huge back and forth. And in the process to, to get these people to back off, they called for a poll tax. And it was a new use for an old tax. The poll tax was an old tax. It, it goes back to ancient times. All adult males are levied a tax on. Uh, it, it's a revenue for governments. And the poll tax was now attached to the right to vote. Set at no, more, no less than 50 cents, no more than a dollar for anyone male over 21 years of age. So they put the poll tax in. Well, that was a controversial issue because that causes poor whites not be able to vote if they have to pay for this tax to be able to vote. And so the, the poll tax is put into the constitution with the intention to use it to disfranchise African-Americans, to sort of target them, to reduce their power, their electorate uh, power. And they, but they don't use it because of backlash from poor whites who can't afford it. So the poll tax stays in the constitution. It's not used until uh, 1890, when finally the state legislature comes in and says, we're going to make this part and parcel of the law. If you don't pay this tax, which is seen in the receipt at the very bottom, which is $2 at that time in 1890, uh, if you don't pay this $2 tax, you're not gonna get the uh, vote. That had a tendency as it did across Jim Crow South to reduce the electorate for African-Americans. It did hurt some poor whites, but Southern states went to work and figure out how they could get poor whites around that provision with various clauses, grandfather clauses, uh, uh, um, um, sort of literacy type things that they could get around it. And the uh, poll tax was uh, remained a controversial issue until it was removed in 1953. Okay, I've gone over my time. I will say this, um, I'm gonna share my PowerPoint has all these points and I will put out my notes if anyone wants to see it or which has it more in a narrative form. I'm happy to share my notes with anyone. Uh, just write me, I'm gonna put my email in the address and I'm happy to answer any questions. So folks, why don't you just post any questions you have in the chat box, if you have any for Dr. Hardy because I know that this is something that folks are always trying to figure out where can I find a thread that pulls through that I can correlate and connect to other things I'm teaching. So hopefully um, 
there are a few things that were mentioned today that might relate to something you're already addressing in your class that you can um, connect to, that you can help flesh out. So um, that helps the constitution, not just be something that you teach in just one moment, but maybe it's something you can refer to and, and um, reference and connect as folks did over the decades. Um, so any questions? Okay, Dr. Hardy, there is a question posted. Were other Southern states making similar changes in limiting manumission? Well, during this period, uh, are we talking about antebellum or are we talking about uh, post-Civil War? When you say limiting main, 1834? Um, yes. Yes, yes, you start seeing that. And, and, and 1831's a critical year. The fear of slave rebellions, Matt Turner, um, the appearance of, of Garrison and his uh, agitation of these abolitionists. And you'll see, even in the uh, 1834 Constitutional Convention, they keep trying to drum up don't forget the lesson of history. Look to Santa Domingo, the island of Santa Domingo, the Haitian Revolution, where slaves rose up against their masters. Uh, this could happen to us. And so in the 1830s, you start seeing codified slave codes becoming much more restricting the uh, behavior of, of slaves and free blacks. So th this is across the board. Uh, Tennessee is a little more progressive in the fact that free blacks could vote in terms in the South. Whereas there was many northern states that did not allow free blacks to vote. And make a note too of your 1870 points and how for those of you all that either have other faculty members or perhaps you're teaching um, the 1950s, 60s um, of the civil rights movement and how the 1870s constitution um, you know, connects there. So- And one, and one thing I would say about the- Yeah, go ahead. One thing I would say about the poll tax and education one of the things, the poll tax, it was supposed to generate revenue for education. And because Tennessee hedged on that, because poor whites were insistent, we don't want this poll tax because we can't afford it. It'll restrict our right to vote. Um, that was held off and that hurt the education system in Tennessee because again, that poll tax was a key part of, of renovate, uh, generating revenue for the school system. Um, that uh, it was a dollar when they first issued it, um, but it went up to two bucks in 1890 for each person, adult male. And can you see the next question, Dr. Hardy? Uh, what do most historians attribute the amount of growth during the period and how it exceeded the growth rate of the U.S.? What, uh, are we still talking about the early part when I gave those numbers about the huge growth? It, it, uh, Drew, is that what you're asking? Um, well, I, I tell you, you've got people moving in the country, you've got immigration, but you got people moving west. And the reason Tennessee in that 33 year period, I said grew six fold while the nation as a whole doubled is because people are moving west into, in our, so to speak, into our backyards as they're moving west from across the Appalachian Mountains. So uh, that's why there's huge growth in the frontier and, and what is the frontier at that time, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, and, and various aspects. Uh, the huge growth. You know, and, and the fascinating thing for the 1790s on through the early 1800s is that Tennessee is where it's happening. <laughs> it's either it's happening true. here, coming through here, kicking off here. And so Tennessee is really U.S. history in a microcosm. I mean, um, I would argue you know, everything from the state of Franklin going forward. I would argue all of our history is is American history, but yes, you're right. Such rich history in yeah. the first half. Uh, let's see. Who Another is this? question. The Brewer, my students often ask, how can the Tennessee state constitution can take away the right of African men the right to vote if the federal government had? Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, that was big. The moderates in the 1870 constitution are like, look, the 15th amendment is going to the states. They, the convention met from January to March, 1870 or January to February, I'm sorry, 1870, the 15th Amendment, which had been passed in Congress in 1868, had been ratified. It was going into effect in March of 1870 as the convention was wrapping up its work. And it would have been foolish to write a slap in the face of the federal government to strip African-Americans the right to vote. So these moderates are pleading to these radical rebel hardliners, don't you dare to, you know, strip African-Americans the right to vote we'll come up with an ingenious way with our poll tax. And, and, and again, the sort of various aspects of Jim Crow 
segregation is foreshadowed in our 1870 constitution. We're doing it earlier than some of the other Southern states. Now granted, some of them did, so they did black codes and such. So it's really a presentation of obstacles to voting. Oh yes. That, um, yeah, instead of just coming right out and taking the vote away, it's yeah. it's presenting the the and if you obstacles. look if okay. you look across the South, um, yeah, in theory, the Fifteenth Amendment is there. The federal government protects you, but the obstacles are there at the state level to reduce. On paper, oh, they still have the right to vote, but these obstacles and violence and intimidation drops Af uh, African American voting rights to. Uh, the, the eligible population to like, you know, single digits in some Southern states during the Jim Crow South. So it isn't exactly. Good question. So yes, great questions. And um, thank you again. I think you posted your contact information. Yes. And I apologize. So if y'all want to, yeah. No, that's fine because Rebecca, actually Rebecca Bird, I already introduced um, and Dr. Hardy, I don't know if you can stick around you know there might be some questions to come up and just yeah so but what um i think it's going to help now after having this incredible overview of the 1834-1870 um constitutions to have rebecca bird come on board and she is she's developed some materials um kind of an activity and and she's already done some thinking about how to kind of get down to the brass tacks of things to share with the students that at least will prompt the discussion so that you can get into more depth where you want to. So um, Rebecca, do you wanna come on? And, and um, William, if you can stop share screen so that she will. And we'll get everything kind of switched over. Okay, and Rebecca's working on getting everything set up on her end. Sorry guys, we seem to be having technical difficulties. Let me try one more time, see if I can get this to work. Aha. Okay, so this is our Teach Tennessee History website, which some of you are probably familiar with. You've seen this before. Um, I posted the link over in the chat if you want to see a skip over there and follow along. Um, and we have a few items here that I wanted to share with you that relate to today's lesson. And then I have some things that we created specifically for today's um, lecture that goes along with that. So under curriculum materials, um, if you look, we have it divided by a kind of historical era. And so under constitution and government, um, we have an essay on Tennessee's constitutions. Um, and then it has, in addition to the essay itself, it also has links to primary sources and kind of a student activity that goes along with this. So this particular one covers all three of the constitutions that we've looked at today. Then under the heading of growth in the new nation, um, we have an essay on Tennessee statehood, which would relate directly to the first part of today on um, William Blunt and the first constitution. And then under the reconstruction era, we have um, an essay that talks about the 1870 constitution, um, but also the role of black legislatures, because this is the, the time period um, when we saw <clears throat> Black men being elected, particularly for Middle and West Tennessee, um, to serve in the Tennessee legislature. So we've got those materials for you, as well as a lot of other great materials on our Teach Tennessee History website. Um, and on the Google Doc that I've shared with you guys for today, um, you can see links to the various things that we kind of have going here. And I'm going to talk about these sort of three things that are listed down here for you guys today. We're going to look at this first one kind of together, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit about how you might use this in your classroom. Um, I also made a printable version of it because even though I know 
Uh, a lot of us have one-to-one -one capabilities in our classroom. Sometimes it's actually really good to get, you know, pieces of paper in kids' hands, um, particularly after the time we've had with COVID and a lot of remote learning, like sometimes that works really well. So there's a, a printable handout version of it. Um, and then I also use Pear Deck a lot in my classroom because I like the ability to do that sort of formative assessment. Um, and so if you um, are familiar with Pear Deck. This has already got Pear Deck. It's already kind of created as a Pear Deck. It's got the questions in there. If you don't know anything about Pear Deck, you're welcome to hang on at the end and I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, and I also included the link if you want to sign up for a free trial of that as well. Um, so, but I'm going to skip back over and we're going to see if we can skip and look at Um, the activity that I prepared for us here. And so I'm going to ask you guys if you'll, um, I saw that a lot of people, it looked like we had some eighth grade teachers, we had some high school teachers, we had some fifth grade teachers. And um, one of the things I noticed when I looked at the teaching standards and all those different grades, as Dr. Hardy did as well, is there's, there's not exactly kind of a common theme. So I decided that to me, the common theme that we really looked at and that our scholars talked about today is the kind of the changes that happen in suffrage. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to really do in this presentation is talk about vocabulary, um, especially I taught eighth grade for a long time. This is my this will be my second full year teaching high school, but I did 24 years teaching eighth grade. Um, and so suffrage was a word that kids had a lot of trouble understanding because um, it's, it doesn't sound like what it means, right? Like it, it sounds like you're in pain is what my kids always said. Um, so I thought definitely before starting into this lesson, you would want to talk about suffrage. And this actually comes from, um, I did the secondary literacy training that the state was offering this summer. So this was a, like a, a tool or a template that they kind of offered for, for teaching about vocabulary. Um, and so this just kind of comes up and lets you go through this with your students. Um, to kind of get them understanding the definition of suffrage. So that would be kind of the first part. And then another word that um, Dr. Hardy used a lot and that we, we use a lot when we talk about suffer or voting rights and constitutions is the word franchise. And that's another word that I think kids have a hard time with because um, we often today use the word franchise to mean something like a chain of restaurants, right? Like we're going to get a McDonald's franchise. And so again, this is a very kind of different specialized history meaning, um, and it's a good one to talk about. So kind of the same thing, talking them through that definition, help them understand um, the, the origin of it. And I thought this was kind of interesting when I looked this up, because I didn't know this, that it comes from the French word franc, which meant freedom because the, the people who were the Franks were the ruling class and therefore were free people and everybody else was more like the serf class or the enslaved class or were not free people, which I thought was interesting. Um, and so kind of the same thing, it just lets you have a, a method for talking them through those two really key definitions because if they understand those two words, then I think you're gonna be able to dig a little bit more into the documents. Um, and so what I basically did is went through and picked out these key sections of the Constitution. So Dr. Hardy had um, some of the same ones in his PowerPoint that he shared with us. Um, and so what I would ask the kids to do is look at it and to identify unfamiliar words. So if you wanted to do this, sorry, it doesn't look like my screen is advancing for you guys. Maybe it will advance here in a second. Oh, there we go. Um, so what um, you would do is just ask the kids to identify those unfamiliar words. And I know particularly I saw there was somebody in here who's a fifth grade teacher. They're probably going to pick out a lot of unfamiliar words. So you may want to, um, you know, adjust that direction a little bit. Even my eighth graders would have found a lot of unfamiliar words here. But that's actually okay. Because if you talk about a lot of this vocabulary and, you know, as in the 1796 Constitution, that should help them when we do 1834, 1870 in the modern constitution. So go through, kind of work through that vocabulary with them. Um, and then just ask the question, who had the right of suffrage in the 1796 constitution? And let the kids kind of talk through that and say, you know, who is that person? Sorry, it doesn't seem like it's advancing very well. 
I'll skip again, see if that works a little bit better. Um, and then essentially we're just going to repeat that. So we're gonna do that with the 1834 constitution, um, kind of that same procedure over and over. And hopefully by making it be a very similar kind of lesson um, that will help the kids, particularly if you wanna like put them in groups and let them work on this as group work, because you're asking for the same sort of intellectual task from them each time. So that should make it a little bit easier for them to dig into the text itself. Um, and so after this one, we're going to do a little bit of a comparison. Um, and there's really three questions that we're going to look at here. Who was disenfranchised by the 1834 Constitution? Who was enfranchised? Um, and who still did not have the right of suffrage under the 1834 Constitution? And so Dr. Hardy really talked about all of those things in his presentation that, of course, uh, free black men who owned property were disenfranchised. White men, regardless of property status, were enfranchised. And we could talk about women, but also we saw in the 1834 Constitution, uh, felons are also disenfranchised here. So uh, there, there you can have a discussion about those things. And then again, we move to the 1870 Constitution. It's going to ask us to take those same steps, identify the unfamiliar words, talk about who has the right of suffrage. Um, and then, and it's interesting to note too, um, how much longer these sections get, like how just much more they talk about it um, and what those requirements are. We see the poll tax that Dr. Hardy talked about as well here. Um, we're going to discuss who had the right of suffrage in the 1870 Constitution. And I thought that, uh, Brewer, um, you had a great question because I think your kids are spot on in wanting to understand the difference between having the right legally stripped or just having so many obstacles put in front um, to make it sort of in practice taken away from them, even though that on paper that right still existed. Um, so we'll look at, again, those same questions. And then um, finally, I included looking at the current constitution because I wanted to make sure that we were able to um, also talk about women's suffrage. I know we just had the, the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and sadly, because it fell in the time of COVID, we didn't get to sort of celebrate it in quite the way that, that we all maybe wanted to or had planned to do, um, but I wanted to include this as well. And then also talk about um, lowering the age limit, because I think that's an important um, consideration as well that they, you know, initially we're looking at 21 and then it drops to 18 and you can talk about the reasons behind that. Um, and so the kind of the last thing that I wanted the kids to do is really think about this in terms of change over time. So what is the change between 1796 and 1834 and what caused that? What caused the change between 1834 and 1870? And then lastly, to kind of help them maybe make some connections to today, um, we we'll talk about what is the overall trend for suffrage in Tennessee's constitutions. And then um, you can talk about a couple of questions that come up. One that Dr. Hardy mentioned is like, should felons be disenfranchised? Um, and there's a lot of research out there. You can kind of look at that and, and um, come up with some sources if you want to give them or have your students look at this yourself, but all the states have sort of different rules on this. And Tennessee's is actually uh, much more restrictive than some other states. Like there are a couple of states where even people who are currently in prison can vote. They're allowed to vote by mail-in ballot. Um, whereas in Tennessee, um, people who have a felony conviction, I believe, lose their, their right to vote indefinitely unless they do some, they go through a number of steps to actually get their voting rights restored. So that's something to definitely talk about. Um, and then the other question that I think, particularly if you teach high schoolers is interesting is, you know, should 16 year olds have suffrage? So there, there's an argument out there and people have talked about, well, you know, 16 year olds can drive a car, they can hold down jobs. I have some 16 year old students who work close to 40 hours a week. I don't think that's good necessarily, but they do. Um, so, you know, should there be some kind of suffrage for 16 year olds? And that's something that the kids could talk about as well. So, and I will tell you guys, this, this particular slide backdrop, this comes from Pear Deck. So if you're familiar with that, um, 
it's it gives the kids ability to kind of draw on the computer and do those sorts of things, but you don't have to do it this way. You could simply have the question, have them write out an answer, or they could just talk through it on their own um, if you wanted to do it that way instead. So I am going to go back and I'm going to put myself back over here so I can see Zoom a little bit better. And I'm also going to stop sharing. Um, and I'm going to see if anybody has any questions you want to ask me about the activity. And then I'll turn it back over to Lisa if you guys don't have any questions about the activity. Um, and we'll kind of finish up from there. questions that anybody has about the activity. I think that at least gives us some ideas, gives you some ideas. I'm sure you already do some creative things in your classroom. My apologies for my phone. Um, so let's see, excellent ideas. And go back and just take a second to scroll back through your chat box to see what is there as far as links. Um, there's some good questions there. Dr. Hardy left his information. He's willing to give you some more notes and answer questions because as with anything, this is just scratching the surface. And you know, some scholars spend their entire careers um, looking at these issues. None of us have that time, but there are lots of great folks around that have spent that time. They're willing to share it with you. And just look at the discussion that's going on in our current day. Um, you know, one of the things I think that always strikes me is how we still have this balance between state and federal. Um, that's a discussion that still goes on today and then local, state, federal. So when you talk about branches of government, a lot of folks say it's really hard for me to find a way to teach branches of government. Well, you know, sometimes you see it in the newspaper. So, um, you know, think of some creative ways to do to do this. So we do have. Um, so Rebecca is going to be um, posting the evaluation. And as I said, if you can go in and click, click there in the chat box and um, go ahead and complete your evaluation. And with the completion of the evaluation, once you finish and you know, click that you finished and, and follow through with it, it should generate and email you the certificate. So if there's a problem with that, you know, just let us know and I can you know, make one up for you. I have done the registration list a couple of times now during the presentation. Thank you for everyone um, for sticking around. And um, this was a great opportunity to learn. And I think I thank Dr. Hardy and he said that he will we will be on. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. And thank you again for everyone joining us. Let me go ahead and stop this.